Vestuary by Jim Burke. And the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Number one. Spout. Hey? Oh, no, no, it's not Satan, no. You help yourself, pal. Sit yourself down. Ah. Oh. Good pint, that. Quiet night. Hey, I'll tell you what. You wouldn't think to look at me, but a few years back, I was the mightiest whale in the whole of God's ocean. Wouldn't think that, eh, to look at me now. Ah, yeah, go on with you, you don't have to soft-soap me. Scare from barnacles all over me nut, this fin on me, useless flapping thing that it is. But I tell you what, in those days, they knew I was coming. Them days, I could have taken everybody in this room with one sweep of my tail. I had some prospects back then. <laughs> what? I could have sired nations, me. You wouldn't think it, would you? <sighs> Grand time to be alive, then. Well, the earth was brand new, eh? Two, three thousand years old tops. Wasn't so long since the, uh, what do you call it? The great flood had come and gone. Good times. The watery ways lighten up before me like they're saying, This way, la! This way for the lucky lad with the cheeky smile for them strapping lassies of the southern herds. Oh, aye. They had me down for a stud in them days. I wasn't arguing. Yep, it was all there waiting for me on a great big plate. Tell you what, you're young. The truest thing you'll ever hear. Don't count your chickens. The thing that gets me, it was a beautiful day to start off with. I just popped up for a quick spout, get a lungful, blow off a couple of sprays, you know. And I'm there, gently tossing on the billows, and then I feel it. Cold front rolling over me. Whoa! Bitter in it. A storm come on, just like that. So I think, hey up, best get myself back under. I geared myself for the big plunge, and... That's when I felt it. You ever been grabbed hard by the scruff of the spout hole by some great big invisible hand? Yeah, just me then. I was held fast there, tail flashing this way and that. Now it took a do. I'm going, what's to do here? Then I get turned round, right round full 90 degrees. And off in the distance, just a spot at first. But it gets nearer, and I can see it's this storm-wrecked, raggy-ass ship, shifting like Billy or ahead of the wind, heading straight for me. Sailors on the deck, clear as you are to me now, I can see them, lashing their teeth, afeard of the storm, breaking it they are, and some great big cuff-puffle going on between them. The dozy apers not even looking where they're going, and wanting to shout, Whoa! Whoa now! But I'm a rabbit in the headlights, my whole life before my eyes. I've got 32 tonnes of timber ready to smash into me nut when these sailors, the effed up, some scruffy little scarecrow of a fella, right above the heads and whoosh, over the side with him. The ship swears, all 30 tonnes of it misses me by that much. But this fella, they fired overboard. He's like he's in free fall, giving it the old windmill impressions with his arms, and he's plummeting right towards me. And I'm gawping up at him, he's gawping down at me, both of us gobs open in amazement. And before I know it, yeah, you guessed it. <sighs> oh, I can still feel him slipping down now, down the old gullet. Of course, at the time, after the initial panic stations, I'm telling myself, there's no you can do about it now, is there? K sera sera and all that. In the meantime, you've got some top quality rumpy waiting for you way down in the barmy south. What's the priority here? So, nothing else for it. Put him out of my mind. It's tail up, head down, and off like a bomb down those crystal autobahns under the sea. Clear channel opening up ahead there. A hanger left at the isthmus hard by the Crescent Reefs. 
whoops, up over the sedimentary ridge there, nearly didn't see that. Sauna's working a treat, though. Head for the coral atoll way off in the distance. Hang about. Sedimentary ridge? I don't remember that at all. OK, let's try this way. I follow the shelf, keeping an eye out for a sunken hull somewhere around here. Should, should be somewhere. But no, nowhere to be seen. What, what's going on here? By the time I eventually surface for a fresh lungful and a quick shifty, I haven't the foggiest idea where I am. But, but I do know this. This is one weird place. Volcanoes belching fire all around. Skies the colour of smoke and sulphur. Andy looking sea snakes writhing around in gangs. I'm snagging up poxy, stinking seaweed everywhere I turn. Nice neighbourhood. And that's when he starts giving me jip. Whoa, the little... I can still feel it now. The feel of that little... Oh, I won't say it. Them scratchy little hands of his clawing away at my stomach wall in despair. And howling and lamenting for hours on end. I'm trying to figure out a plan of action there and I can't hear myself think. Oh, what I'd have given to have had him within walloping distance of me tail right then. I'd have given him something to lament about, all right. You, you, you get to thinking, don't you? You're lost, you're hungry, you're scared. You've got some screaming nut job tearing chunks out of you from the inside. And to cap it all, you've got 20,000 metric tonnes of marine pressure playing havoc with your migraine. You get to thinking, why me, eh? Of course, the last thing you expect when you ask that is some kind of an answer. I'll, I'll be honest with you, by now I'm ready to chuck in the towel. I, I was at my lowest point ever. But then, then this voice, this colossal, awesome, booming voice, unlike anything I've ever heard, made me tingle all over it did. It says, Thou fish, seek ye dry land. OK, normally, I don't go for being called fish. All right, I can get a bit prickly if anyone starts bandying that around in my earshot. I mean, do I look like a fish to you? But this voice, it's loaded with such, oh, I don't know, calm authority. I don't mind what it calls me. Not a bit. And I'm looking around trying to figure out where it's coming from and wanting to hear it again. Because the feeling it gives me, it's, it's, it's like, it's like, oh, what's it like? It, it's like being stroked by thousands upon thousands of soft velvety fins. It's like the songs of blubbery young whale cows sounding across the oceans of time. It's like the music of cherubic little calves swimming through their mammy's milk that somehow has been splashed across the night sky and form new constellations, new galaxies, where everything is beautiful. So beautiful. <laughs> oh, hey. Will you look at me now? <laughs> Big soppy get. Oh, oh ta. Ah. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> I bet you're expecting me to whip out the leaflet now, eh? We meet every Sunday, Tuesday and Thursday, bring your own tambourine. <laughs> but, but I'm telling you, I heard what I heard. But where that voice is coming from, I haven't a clue. In fact, the only thing I can see through all this darkness down here is that big round moon way up there looking down at me. And I'm thinking, could it be? Could that be where this voice is coming from? And I think, yeah, because when this voice comes to me again, the moon, it gives a little shiver. The way a hefty great diva's chins wobble when she hits a high note. It says, Did I not tell ye fish to seek dry land? That's enough of a kick up the backside for me. I peel myself up from the ocean floor and I'm rocketing up to the surface like you know what I've done. I burst from the water like a Polaris. Hey, you should have seen the looks on them sea snakes then. They weren't so tough after all. Scatter they did. And I'm up. 
shooting up in the air. Wouldn't have been surprised if I'd kept going and all, all the way to the moon. But then it's boom, back in the water. And after that moon, how long was I at it? Hours it must have been. But before I know it, wham! I'm tearing up the beach like a stonking great asteroid, sending great spumes of sand 30 foot high. Whoa, hey! I slam the brakes on. Your man inside me here, he keeps going. Shoots straight out of me gullet like a bolt of phlegm he goes. Oh, the relief. I just lay there, savouring the moment. Well, I'd done as I'd been told. I'd found dry land and I awaited further instructions. Only, the moon wasn't there anymore. The sun had come up, see. Phew, scorching, sweltering. And there was no voice now but the lapping surf and the wheeling gulls and a weird, rapid kind of wheezing. It takes me a while to realise it's me gasping through my spout hole, ten to the dozen. Because I'm just waking up to the reality of the scariest word that any of us, and I don't care how big you think you are, the scariest, most blood-freezing word that any whale can ever hear. Beached. Oh, of course, he's all right, sitting there blinking away. Then he goes scrambling backwards away from me, kicking up the sand like he thought I was going to belly flop up the beach and gulp him down all over again. Ah, I should cocoa. And even if I'd a mind to, he can see I'm in no position to do out of the sort. Got one fin hanging off by a thread. Sand's crusting up my eyes. Can't hardly breathe, what with my own weight bearing right down on my lungs by now. And I'm looking at him thinking, Yeah, that's right. Come on, genius. Don't sit there gawping at me. Come and give us a push. He stands up, shakes himself down, gets his bearings, and then suddenly it's like he's poleaxed. He stands there like he's hovering in midair, a daft look on his face. And I recognise this look because it's the one I had when the moon spoke to me. But this time, I'm here in now. And he's standing on his tiptoes, gazing upwards with a gormless ass smile like he's got a fish up tugging away at his top lip or something. And then he starts walking. Tugged by that fish up, so to speak, off in the direction of the sand dunes away in the distance. And I'm thinking, Oi! Oi now! I'm all flaming right, Jack. What's the crack here? But he keeps on walking. Doesn't even do me the courtesy of a backward glance. And he clambers up over the dunes. By now he's a spot in the distance, his head just over the rise. And then he's gone. And I'm on my own. Tell you what. I never thought I'd miss that fella. All day I lay there. Sun pounding down on me. My lungs getting more useless than a pair of shriveled up mermaid's purses. Then the sun drops and the moon comes up. I'm not happy with that moon and I tell it so. Reckoning it's kind of taken me for a bit of a mug here if you ask me. Still, I know I won't stay miffed at it for long. If only to say something to me again. Say something in that wondrous velvety way it's got anything anything at all say out just one sentence a word any word come on one word for your old mate here come on now come on please now one word a time gentlemen please now Always happens, that. Just when you're getting into your stride, eh? Yeah, he did all right for himself. Jonah. Quite a celebrity he ended up on the preaching circuit. Of course, no one even knows my name. Nobody gives a monkeys. I'm not bitter. Uh, Smithy, by the way. My name. Smithy. Eh, uh, nah, it's, uh, I better not. Got to be heading down to the beach now. Yeah. My bones are still there in the sand. Don't like to leave them there by themselves, all in the lonesome. Know what I mean? Tide lapping through them. Crabs scuttling in and out. Ribs all bleached white in the moonlight. Flaming moonlight. Flaming moon.
Dear sir, with regard to your article concerning the legend of the so-called Hartlepool monkey, reputedly washed ashore during the Napoleonic Wars and hanged by local fishermen as a French spy, I would like to point out that the alleged incident, even if true, in no way constituted a unique case in those paranoid times. Number two. Letters to a monkey's uncle. 27th of May, 1805. Dear Uncle Emile, how glad I am that I took your wise counsel to travel and see something of the world. You would, I fancy, feel a touch of pride if you could see your favourite nephew at this present moment, commissioned to a rating of no less than ship's mascot, and decked out in a rather fetching brocade frock coat, augmented with side pockets and an ingenious back flap for the protrusion of one's tail. How this ill-groomed crew must envy me my sartorial savoir-faire. I dare say it is this envy that prompts the brutes to swipe me from the dinner table and call me all sorts of beastly names should I but deposit the merest droppings in their wretched sleeping quarters. Still, the captain of this noble vessel seems to have taken rather a shine to me and frequently allows me the liberty of his cabin, the dimensions of which, incidentally, permit me to swing back and forth most agreeably. Monsieur the captain pronounces often upon the merits of this leaking chamber pot, as he affectionately calls his ship, which is presently and indefinitely a circumnavigating a dung hill called Great Britain, the purpose of which action being to affect the slow starvation of the lice, as he says, which inhabit that land. <laughs> It's all highly exciting, and my present intent is to render you a diverting account of this adventure, which, in view of the excellent seamanship of our captain, is sure to have a successful outcome. Please forgive the dampness of these pages, dear uncle. The ship was lost last night with all hands perishing. As for myself, I was fortuitously delivered from the perilous seas and now lie gasping but unharmed upon a picturesque stretch of shoreline. It is fortunate that I seem to have been washed up on so secluded a spot as I am afraid I should make rather a frightful spectacle to any early morning strollers. <laughs> The handsome frock coat of which I wrote with such pride has been reduced to a festoonery of tatters, indistinguishable from the stinking seaweed which garlands me about. Still, one must thank Providence for allowing me a moment to myself. Oh! Dash it all, dear uncle! <clears throat> Forgive that intemperate outburst, but... I notice emerging from a distant beach hut several fellows who seem to have observed my presence. <laughs> I'm afraid it's all too, too humiliating. Yes, yes, dear friends, I am, as you see, most amusingly dishevelled. <laughs> Hey-ho. Well... I suppose the very least I can do before offering these fellows the hand of friendship is to give it a jolly good combing. Oh, steady there! Oh, how right you were, Uncle, when you advised me that a gentle primate should ever preserve the best possible appearance in public! Oh, I'm afraid that my less than well-groomed condition has rather encouraged these beach dwellers to take liberties with my person. Oh, oh. and hale and hearty as they are, they somewhat underestimate the robustness of their handling. Still, I was rather heartened by two of their number endeavouring to explain to me the precise nature of their calling, which, as betokened by the large net they both proudly flourished at me, I took to be the noble trade of fishermen. 
Unfortunately, in their enthusiasm to communicate this intelligence to me, they inadvertently heaved this netting over my person, whereupon I instantly became entangled within its ill-smelling meshes. <laughs> Uncle, I have urgent and troubling news to communicate. Having been dragged into the midst of an excitable crowd, I found myself being accidentally struck from all sides as these good people valiantly, but to my mind rather simple-mindedly, attempted to kick and thump asunder the fisherman's net which yet confined me. In the midst of these vain endeavours, one tooth-blackened yahoo thrust his face close to mine and gave me to understand that there were rumours abroad that I was the better-looking twin of some iniquitous Frenchman he called Bony Parts. And, well, the plain fact of the matter is that I am to be put on trial upon the morrow as a French spy. Clearly these accusations have their origins in the malicious intent of a skulking clack of troublemakers. But... Such is the democratic rectitude of this land, even the most absurd imputations must receive a hearing. (laughs) La, let it be so. I confess, I am rather looking forward to refuting these contemptible charges. My knowledge of this land grows apace with each passing minute. I have discovered, for instance, that its rough-hewn inhabitants have named it Art Le Boule. And what a strange and fascinating place it is! Not the least of its marvellous aspects have to do with its peculiar legal procedures, which I am even now experiencing at first hand. Having hauled me from the net and restored me to a semblance of dignity, they then proceeded to shave every inch of my body. A ceremony no doubt designed to confer honorary citizenship upon me, thus guaranteeing equality before the law. You must remember, Uncle, that these art Lepoulians are, for the most part, hairless. The day's ceremonials ended with some gaiety, the whole assembly pursuing me to and fro over the sands, penning me into a rocky enclave and pelting me with festering codheads. I confess the full significance of this last proceeding eludes me, though I was very much touched by its mystery. Thereafter, I was escorted to the comfort and seclusion of a private beachside cell, which, though rather cramped, It was previously employed, I am given to understand, as a lobster pot, yet affords me both wholesome air and sufficient leisure to prepare my defence. Despite the challenge to my mental facilities occasioned by a growing hunger, I have spent a constructive hour attempting to communicate my plea as meticulously as possible to the turnkey assigned to my cell. I should mention in passing that this is the fellow I previously and somewhat unjustly referred to as a tooth-blackened yahoo. He is, in truth, a cheerful cove much given to unrestrained laughter, particularly when he good-naturedly perceives me gnawing at the bars of my cell, which are, by the way, most pleasingly infused with a piquancy reminiscent of lobster thermidor. Many hours have passed since my last entry in this correspondence, and I still have not been offered a drop to drink nor a bite to eat. It seems, moreover, that my trial is to be delayed once more as the sun begins to decline, and the crowds have dispersed, leaving only a small guard of fishermen feasting around a fire to keep watch over my needs. 
My esteemed turnkey is amongst their number, and though he most charitably hurled a tasty-looking morsel in my direction, it fell short, so I was unable to reach it through the bars of my cell. Alas, this simple act of charity has rather had the effect of driving me to the brink of distraction and despair. Still, courage... Courage. What a strange night has passed, Uncle. As I crouched there in the darkness of my cell, slipping in and out of consciousness, oftentimes gazing as though bewitched at the sands bathed white by the cold light of the moon. I suddenly saw that moon crack open with a thunderous roar, and from it I saw hundreds, nay, thousands of monkeys issuing forth. Every class, species and genus was there, represented spilling and scampering from out of that lunar fissure. And they began to gather about my cell. And you may think me distracted, Uncle, but... They hailed me, and they declared me to be no less than... No, I do not dare to think upon it. I will not think upon it. Such visions are born of a mind distorted by want of food, of water, of justice. Away, all of you. The night is over. The sublime majesty of this dawn dares me to think of the substance of last night's revelation. That I, Pierre, have arisen to the preeminent position in the universal Simeon Empire. And now I see again the faces of my hosts gathering around me. Yes. Even these, these poor, degenerate creatures, they are also my subjects. But I shall raise them. I shall set them free. Ah, they seem to perceive my thoughts. For now they seize my cell and pitch it this way and that in their zeal to set me at liberty. And now they haul me out into the sunshine. What a day of joy. What a dawn of glory! I am carried aloft on a piece of driftwood, high above the heads of the assembled throng. Such a hurling of caps, such a raising of hurrahs! My turnkey laughingly restores me to my former sartorial elegance as he drapes across my shoulders a smart little overcoat of distinctly martial appearance. And from a humble scrap of paper, he ingeniously fashions a noble-looking three-cornered hat, which he places reverently upon my head. Another amongst the throng has given me to understand that I should place my hand, like so, inside the breast part of my overcoat. We progress at great speed across the sands, and the very sun seems to smile upon my coronation. Oh, I shall do great things, dear uncle. I shall engender dynasties. I shall make the mighty and the unjust tremble. I shall spin the world of its axis. Now, we rush on, on towards the dunes where stands a... What is that? A curious wooden structure, silhouetted against the sun, and from the highest beam of which descends a little loop of rope. Ah, I comprehend. I comprehend fully. I am, no doubt, 
expected to execute a sequence of acrobatic feats to authenticate my imperial credentials. Therefore, bring me to it, my friends, faster, faster now. Now watch me swing, uncle, watch me. intend to explode a nuclear device on the moon to produce, quote, a spectacular firework display. We're just getting unconfirmed reports that the Soviet Union has launched yet another man-made satellite into outer space. Sputnik 2 does appear to be carrying a live passenger, not as first believed a human being, but an animal, possibly a dog. Number three, the first dog on the moon. Just before they clanged the door shut on me, Nikolai reached in and shook my paw. Bon voyage, little Laika, he said, which made me wag my tail. And next thing, everything went dark. But Nikolai's face sort of stayed there with me in the dark for a bit, shining like, well, like the moon, funnily enough. Because I've been thinking a lot about the moon lately about how I used to look up at it sometimes in the days I slept in the streets. Because guess who's going to go up there now? Go on, guess. When they put me in here a bit ago, then shut the big clanging door on me, I was really good. I didn't bark or whinge for Nikolai to come back. I just waited in the dark to see what would happen next. The noise is what happened next. Everything suddenly went black and I started dreaming about that time when the dogmen came after us all. Running. Running again. Running through the streets, through the snow. Whole pack of us. Please, please, please don't let them follow me. Follow that fat old scabby thing back there. Or the pug. Short legs on him. He's easy to catch. Don't come after me. Quick look back. Oh, I don't believe this. They're coming after me. Both of them, big and dark against the snow, and they're really fast. But they're only men, and I'm faster than men, so I'll be all right. And then I go and skid on the ice, don't I? Going to get caught now. All of a sudden, another dog shoots out of the passageway, lost her bearings, gone round in circles or something, runs smack into the men, and I almost laugh the way it happens. Then they grab her, snatch her up, like she's nothing. And one of these men... He's put all his weight on her, wrestled her down. The other, he puts both his hands around her neck, squeezes, squeezes hard, his face all screwed up. One of the men, he's got a cigarette hanging from his mouth. Not the one doing the strangling, the other one. The one holding her down. For a long time, smoke from the cigarette drifts up and up, and I watch it go until it disappears. And she's looking at me. Last time this. Last time me and her get the chance to look at each other. Ever. Bye, Mum. Bye bye, Mum. I back off into the shadows. Feel rotten now. These chains are stopping me turning. And for a long time now, I've had this horrible feeling in my stomach. No, not in my stomach. More just like under my skin. Or more like something that's hovering just over my skin. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. But anyway, that's all right. Because really, I'm glad to be in here. Because like I say, I'm going up to the moon. If there was somewhere to look out of in here... And maybe be able to see how near I'm getting to it. But there isn't. Might as well just rest my chin on my paw then. Because it's still got Nikolai's smell on it where he shook it last. And that always makes me feel alright. I like breathing in that smell and thinking about Nikolai. But mostly, I like thinking about getting to the moon. And what I'll do when I get there. I try not to think about the night in the streets with the dogmen and what they did to my mum. 
her slung onto the handcart with all the other dead stray dogs. Wheeled off to. I don't know where they take them. Smithy. He's a scabby old dog I wanted the men to follow instead of me that night. Smithy used to say they take them to the big buildings with the domes on top, where they mince them up and feed them to the rich dogs who live inside. One night when the cold got really hard, like iron at the end of a boot, I curled up against Smithy for extra warmth, and he starts howling up at the moon, but a kind of old dog's howl that limped out of his throat and fell back down to the ground soon as it came out of his mouth. The others laughed at him, and I felt embarrassed for him, but he wasn't embarrassed at all. In the old days, he said, ignoring them, in the old days, they knew how to howl. These young ones just don't appreciate the important things no more, he said. Like the moon shining at full strength up there. So I ask him what he means. Well, he says, in that way that daft old dogs talk to puppies. Well now, long, long time ago, in the forest far away from the city, the dogs all used to sing to it, to the moon, all the time. But after a bit... Their lives got too cosy for them to bother any more, and they were more interested in curling up in front of the fire or licking their owner's hands for scraps, and they forgot the moon was even up there. But all the while, there was a kind of scared smell about their owners, and nobody really knew why. But one day, we found out. One day, the skies went all dark, and some fire came from somewhere. And there was smoke and all the owners suddenly weren't there anymore. And all the dogs in the village got thinner and thinner and colder and colder because there was nobody left to feed them nor huts for them to sleep in anymore. And then, Smithy says, that's when it was that in the sky there rose the moon all big and round and shiny. And all the dogs, whose ribs you could see and whose teeth were all bared, they looked up. And that's when they all started singing again to the moon with songs about how beautiful she was. And I fell asleep that night thinking of them all gliding up to her on their own songs. Up and up and all the way up to curl tight and snug in her and let her take away all their hunger and scaredness. And I woke up crying and wagging my tail at the same time and I didn't even notice the sound of the big van stopping near me or the doors opening and the next thing two big hands are lifting me up and I'm in the back of a van and the doors are closing on me after a long time the truck stops and goes quiet and the door opens takes a bit to get the loop around my neck but finally they manage and I'm out of the truck and in through a door then I'm standing Shaking in the middle of a clump of legs all around me and more hands pick me up and somebody says, Siberian husky, a bitch and then I'm put in a kind of dish somewhere and someone says, 17 pounds, 6 ounces and then my mouth shanked open and a tiny stick shoved up my bum and then a needle in my leg and the next thing I know I'm waking up in a little cage with my head all groggy. The way I felt in the cage that time is a bit like how I feel now. The jelly stuff I'm supposed to suck out of the bottle run out a bit ago and I'm hoping Nikolai will bring some more up here for me because I'll be getting hungry soon and I want to be full enough to have a run around the moon when I get there without having to worry about where to look for food. Maybe he'll also think about bringing me some of those nice chocolate treats as well. I liked Nikolai right away when he came to see me in my cage because he was all gentle with me and knew how to pick me up like I was the same as him, sort of. And when he told me from now on my name would be Lyca, which is a word for someone who barks a lot, it made my tail wag. And one morning, when Nikolai was getting me to pull on a piece of rope with my teeth while he pulled on the other end making noises like a dog, he suddenly gave me a big hug and looked into my eyes. And I could see his eyes were all wet and shiny. And he told me how proud he was of me and that he was going to have to say goodbye to me soon. The next day, in fact. Because I'm the one out of all the other dogs who's been chosen to go up there. But I'm not to be scared because my going up there is going to make the world a better and nicer and more beautiful place. And even though I won't be coming back, 
still I'll be talked of and sung about for years and years to come. I listened to all this, tilting my head from side to side, waiting till he said some words I could catch hold of, which in the end he did. Treat time like her, he said, and he threw up a chockey and I leapt up and caught it, and he gave me another big hug. And I could smell that even though he was all happy, there was still something he was scared of, like there always was. And I wondered if he was scared of the dogmen too. Must have been. Everyone was. Maybe Nikolai won't be coming with my food today after all. Tomorrow then. I'll get him to shake my paw again as well, because the smell of him is beginning to fade away now. Phew. It's getting really warm in here. When Nikolai comes, I'll ask him if I can hang my head out of a window to get a bit of a breeze. <laughs> Nikolai? No. Not here. He's not here. Tomorrow, then he'll be here. Because tomorrow, I'll really need some food. Even if it's only that horrible jelly stuff from the bottle. Nikolai? Nikolai did come to see me before. Even though everything's starting to go a bit blurred. I could easily make him out floating in through the wall and holding his clipboard up, all serious and writing stuff. Then he looked up and saw me and smiled that smile of his and held up a piece of rag in front of him for me to get hold of and pull with my teeth. But I was too weak and couldn't even lift my head up much. But then he reached out and he shook my paw. And then that smell of scaredness that Nikolai and all the other men had, that they always had around them, it was hardly there on Nikolai's hand this time. And I know the reason it's faded is because of me being in here now. Because of where I'm going. And look! I can see the wall of my room fading away. And I can see right through to the outside. And I can see all the dark going on and on for a long time. But at the end of it, I can see the moon. It feels as though I could stretch out my paw and touch it. And it makes me think of that story of the village dog singing to the moon all that time ago. And it seems it was all the dogs in all the villages in the world who were singing to it. Including, it seemed to me, my mum and me. And without even knowing it, here I am doing it too. I can hear myself singing to it now. And I'm gliding up to the moon on my own song. Can you hear us from down there? Listen. In Bestuary, Smithy was played by Sam Kelly, Pierre by Mark Chatterton, and Lyca by Carla Henry. Bestuary was written by Jim Burke and directed in Manchester by Nadia Molinari. <laughs>